There are many aspects to the neurobiology of depression. In this video, I will focus on the link between depression and alterations in the reward system. If you have seen my previous videos about the reward system, you already know that there is one important pathway leading from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens that activates when we expect a reward, something that will give us a good feeling. The activation of the nucleus accumbens leads to a motivation to achieve that reward and therefore goal-related behavior. That is the mechanism that ensures that we do things that will make us happy. But why is the activity of the reward pathway reduced with people with depression? We know that depression typically is triggered by stress, but also that their genetic predisposition plays an important role. With other words, some people react to chronic stress with developing depression, while others seem to be more resilient. People with depression often experience a loss of interest in and motivation for those things that were supposed to make them happy. Nothing seems fun anymore and they can even struggle getting out of bed in the morning. This experience is called anhedonia and is one of the main symptoms and diagnostic criteria of depression. Therefore, it sounds plausible to suggest a dysfunction in the reward system and as the reward pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens provokes motivation and goal-related behavior, it sounds plausible to think that its activity is reduced under depression. And according to many studies, that seems to be the case. People with depression struggle with motivation because the reward pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens is less active. Interestingly, the actual feeling of pleasure from a reward seems to be less affected. So the sensation of nothing makes me happy anymore may actually be the result of an inability to predict and anticipate the feeling of happiness. As explained in one of my other videos about the reward system, another brain region, the ventral pallidum, modulates how many neurons of the reward pathway are active at a given moment, called the population activity. When we experience acute stress, the ventral pallidum makes sure more neurons in the reward pathway are active so that we are better at reacting to stimuli and more motivated and therefore productive in order to handle the stressful situation. This is modulated by a pathway from the ventral hippocampus through the nucleus accumbens to the ventral pallidum that gets inhibited. As the ventral pallidum regulates the population activity by inactivating neurons from the VTA, a less active ventral pallidum leads to a higher population activity. For more information, check out my video about stress and the reward system where I explain this in more details. In that video, I also explain that we experience a period of lower population activity and therefore a less responsive reward pathway sometime after the intense stress has stopped. This has been shown in experiments with rats that were put in a narrow plexiglass for two hours, while in the plexiglass and short time after they had a higher population activity, but 24 hours after they showed a reduced population activity of neurons of the VTA. In a different experiment, rats were given many food shocks throughout the day after a signal indicating the shock but without a way to escape. After one day, they were given the chance to escape. Interestingly, only half of the rats used that chance, the others stayed. When examining the population activity, the rats that escaped still had a high population activity, while those that stayed had developed a kind of compensatory downregulation of the population activity, which made them feel helpless and they were lacking the motivation to flee, something that resembles depressive symptoms. So you could argue that those rats had a predisposition to depressive symptoms after long-lasting stress by having a compensatory downregulation of the population activity, which leads to a less active reward pathway. However, when researchers gave them ketamine, a short-acting antidepressant, their population activity was restored and they escaped the food shocks. Researchers now examined the brains of those two groups of rats and saw that when they stimulated the hippocampus, the let's call them depressed group developed something that is called long-term depression in the pathway from the hippocampus to the nucleus accumbens, the one that is supposed to regulate the response to stress and ultimately leads to an increase in population activity. But what does long-term depression mean here? Basically, it means that the efficiency of the synapses, the connections between the neurons of the pathway, is reduced. Simply said, the signaling in the pathway gets weaker after it had been used for a while, which in the end leads to a lower population activity. 
The other reds, however, react with a long-term potential, which is the opposite. Their pathway from the hippocampus gets stronger the longer it had been used. If the pathway from the hippocampus is weakened more and more, this will lead to a chronically low population activity, as it normally always is supposed to fire signals in a degree, and this leads to a loss of motivation and interests. But if you know, think, perfect, I've never had depression, no depression in my family, I can be safe and handle an unlimited amount of stress and my reward system will just work better and better, then I have to disappoint you. The rats in the experiment were exposed to the exact same amount of stress and divided into two groups according to their response to that amount of stress. In reality, though, everybody has an individual stress tolerance and most likely everybody will, at a certain amount of stress, develop a weakening of that pathway and therefore symptoms of anhedonia. Actually, it is assumed that the mechanism follows an inverted U-shape. Too little stress is not good for us, but too much stress is not good either and will lead to a downregulation of the reward system. And what is just enough and what is too much stress, that is individually different. Some of you may think now, but are there not two types of stress, eustress and distress, with eustress being stress with positive effects on us such as motivation and energy, and distress with negative impact? But probably those two types actually just describe where on the U-shape the stress moves us to, with U-stress moving us to the perfect middle and distress being too much and moving us to the side where we will have a negative impact of it. You could argue that U-stress is something positive because we like it, but maybe the reason that we like it does that it is not as much stress for us as it would be for others, and this can change. Let's imagine an author writing about a topic that interests him a lot. He will feel positively motivated and energized by writing. What if you give him a deadline in near future for finishing the book? What was eustress for him can now become distress, even though he still has the same interest in the topic. If you like my video, check out the other videos about the reward system and don't forget to subscribe to my channel.